Good afternoon, and welcome to Teaching Reading Through Play, A Vygotskian Perspective. So glad you could join us today. I'm Dr. Niall Stanley from the University of North Florida. And there are two parts to this presentation. The first part I will be doing, which is on the theory of play. And my colleague, Roma Cox, will be doing the second portion of the program, which is demonstrating her phonics game. Vygotsky was a Soviet psychologist who lived from 1896 to 1934. He's one of the most important learning theorists in all of psychology of learning. He's up there with the greats like B.F. Skinner and Piaget. His work an influence on education has been extensive. One of his most famous articles is entitled Play and Its Role in the Mental Development of the Child, which originally was a speech in 1933, was translated into the English in the 1960s. It took so long for his work to be translated because of the Cold War at the time between the U.S in Russia. In his work on play, Vygotsky said, play makes for development in three major ways. One is self-gratification. Second is the use of props and symbols. And third, self-regulation. Let's take the example as shown in the picture of children visiting a fire station and learning how to be a fireman. And through this, after they leave the demonstration, of course, they go right to the playground and start playing as firemen. And they learn to save each other. And they might climb to the monkey bars. One student might climb to the monkey bars and say, help, help, help me. The school's on fire and the other children come out with their make-believe hoses and they save the child. And Vygotsky would say this is very important. He would say play is extremely important because all learning is social. And so these children in playing firemen, they get a tremendous sense of self-gratification. They're able to do something in play that they couldn't do in real life. They just saved a person from a fire. So they feel tremendous satisfaction. So that's one of the main functions of play is the self-gratification, the feeling of self-worth, the feeling of accomplishment. Another important thing about play that Vygotsky emphasized is play is not chaotic. In play, there are rules of the game. And through play, children learn many important roles. They know that if you're being saved, you have to wait till you're saved. <laughs> Every play situation has rules that children uh, follow. Uh, and so play is not chaotic. They learn important rules of self-regulation, how to be cooperative, how to take turns, many important social skills that will enable them to sit still for the huge demand of reading. One of the most famous quotes by Vygotsky about play is this very powerful one. In play, a child is always above his average age, above his daily behavior. In play, it is though he were a head taller than himself. So in play, children are capable of accomplishing things that they wouldn't be able to achieve in real life because they're working in what Vygotsky calls the zone of proximal development which is defined as the highest level that you can achieve with assistance. So play, according to Vygotsky, is the ultimate zone of proximal development because it's scaffolded. Play is always scaffolding their learning and their performance. And so you have what a child can do by themselves, but when you give them assistance through scaffolding, they're capable of doing a lot more. And that's one of the most important functions of play, is it's a scaffolded, it's an assistant uh, performance. Vygotsky said the other regulated functioning 
becomes the self-regulated functioning. He said that what the child can do with assistance today, they can do alone tomorrow. So today, they learn about being a fireman, and then tomorrow, they can act as a fireman in play. In reading, this is extremely important, because in reading, a child always has two levels of performance, what they can read by themselves and what they can read with assistance, and that's called the zone of proximal development. So a child might be reading at the first grade level by themselves, but with teacher assistance, teacher scaffolding, they may be able to read two grade levels higher. The same is true with play. When a child plays by themselves being a fireman, they may have no idea what to do, but when they play with an older child, they learn quickly the role of a fireman. And they might learn about carbon monoxide, for example, in playing, that a fireman wears a gas mask. They might not have known that unless they had played. So play, in, in summarizing, is the ultimate uh, zone of proximal development. Vygotsky said a child's greatest achievements are possible in play, achievements that tomorrow will become her basic level of real action and morality. I have developed a theory of literacy called performance literacy, and we teach the children to perform poetry, we teach the children storytelling, and they're capable of doing very high achievement in literacy. And actually, they're playing. They're playing at drama, they're playing at poetry. In these two examples, uh, the children are putting on performances for other students. And so they're achieving at a very high level. And they view it as play. And it's very, sa it's very satisfying. Well, I wanted to take a look at some of the literature that's coming out today. And there's a very popular book right now that's a bestseller called Teach Your Children Well by Madeline Levine. And she is a very world famous uh, children's psychologist. And this is what she said about play. She said, play is the most efficient driver of learning for children. This is as true of their cognitive development as their physical development. As a matter of fact, it is so essential for healthy children, it has been recognized by the United Nations as being a right of every child. Did you know that the United Nations thinks play is so important they have a resolution guaranteeing children all over the world the right to play? And that gives me an idea. I'd love to be with the play police and go into some of these classrooms and blow the whistle. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. You need to give the children a chance to play. I've watched you teaching all day, and I have not seen any indication that the children are playing. You're under arrest. I'm citing you for the, breaking the rule of the United Nations. Children have a right to play. In fact, in Madeleine Levine's latest research, she said that play is no longer a significant part of childhood. I'll say that again. Play is no longer a significant part of childhood. Play has been erased because of the demands of high stakes testing, uh, using technology like Facebook, the internet, the fear of violence, the fear of going outside. So the amount of play that children have has been reduced in the last few years. And in some schools, recess has been canceled in order to practice for the high stakes test. And what has been the results of this, folks? She's a psychotherapist, and she has seen a rise in children depression, children suicide, because of the stress in our society to achieve more and more. Also, the use of Prozac by teachers is at an all time high because they themselves are under the stress to perform. She cites in her book, what we're doing is not working. As far as literacy goes compared internationally, China is number one in literacy, math, and science. The United States is like 15th in reading, 17th or 20 in math and science. 
what we're doing is not working. It's producing a huge amount of stress, which she has documented in her private practice working with children and adults. So she says that you need to be aware of this, that the children are not being uh, taught the whole child. We're only concentrating on uh, academic development and we are neglecting social and emotional development. And that's why we need play as an outlet for healthy development of the whole child, the emotional development and the social development. That's what play uh, can provide. I have conducted research on game-based teaching for many years. In fact, I have taught courses on game-based teaching at the graduate and undergraduate level, and they're very popular uh, courses. And I wrote an article in 2002 on using games to teach English as a second language. And this is kind of a summary of what my research found. Research with game-based teaching indicates successful teaching and learning activities are characterized by meeting three criteria. Engagement, internalization and transfer, and promotion of collaborative, independent, and interdependent learning. So if you're playing games, and the research says that teachers who use games have higher achievement, teachers who use games are also rated more favorably by their students. So the research is clear that game based teaching is highly effective. However, you must make sure that your game is matching the standards that you're expected to teach. If you're working with Common Core, you need to ask yourself, what standards, what indicators of Common Core does this game meet? You need to answer that question. Also, you need to ask yourself, are the children engaged in the game? Do they look like they're learning? Do they look like they're doing something that's going to promote literacy. Also, are they able to transfer the skills that they learn? You say that you have a phonics game, you say they are engaged, but can they take up a book and use those skills to read a book? Is there transfer from the game? That's a very important thing to ask. Does it, uh, does it promote collaboration? Uh, at can they work independently and can they also work collaboratively in the game? And, and you'll see that her game that she will demonstrate shortly matches all those criteria. And I gave her game a very favorable review uh, because it meets those uh, categories as indicated by the research. To summarize, to borrow the words of Benjamin Franklin, who stole these words from a Chinese proverb, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. Now Benjamin Franklin, one of our founding fathers, knew more than anyone the value of play and loved to write uh, comic uh, pieces. And at the age of 17, Franklin left New York he said, the people are too uptight in New York. This is a, and he said, uh, I'm going to go to Philadelphia where I know they enjoy humor. And he began at age 17 writing a paper called The Spectator, which was humorous uh, sayings and humorous essays. He loved to play with language. And this is one of his famous quotes, which he admits that he stole from a Chinese proverb. And we can bring into this a little bit of uh, the total physical response which uh, is very good in game playing and learning language. If you would all stand up, please, and we'll practice a little game playing. And I'm going to teach you this saying using total physical response, which is a common teaching strategy for teaching English as a second language. It's been verified by research. So do and say what I do. You ready? 
Everyone do this? And say, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do. And I understand. Now you practice it together now by yourselves. Go. And again, as you see, to learn anything, you need repetition. And uh, let's try it. This is your third time. Let's try it one more time. You ready? Go. I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. Very good. And give yourself a round of applause, and you may be seated. And of course, if I was... Uh, in with the standards-based teaching, I would take out my rubric now and I would grade each of your performance and put the, put the results in the newspaper and uh, I would assess you and uh, use metrics, uh, but of course that's not needed, but that's what's routinely done. We're so assessment-oriented now that everything needs to be assessed, but you can assess very well in games informally. You don't need all, all these rubrics. Um, all the time, and we overuse rubrics, uh, I think, sometimes. And Mr. Rogers, who's the greatest uh, early childhood teacher of all times, had a show that ran for, what, about 25 years? Mr. Rogers, he never used the word rubric once, and he's considered the greatest uh, educator of all times of early childhood, Mr. Rogers, who passed away a few years ago, and he was a firm believer uh, in play. Here you see in this photograph, I'm doing performance literacy, and the children are acting out uh, the Lorax by Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss is one of the greatest adherents of playing with language. Think right, think left, think of all the things that you can think. Think right, think left, think of all the things that you can think. He's got 46 books uh, advocating the use of play and he says that learning language is best is when it's presented as fun, uh, as play. I wonder if the school bought those hats for the children. No, they didn't because they spent all their money on buying tests. And that happens today with so many of the schools. They spend all their funds on testing. There's not much left over. The hats were donated by a publisher, uh, which is the case so many times. You have to ask your question to yourself. When you're spending all this money on tests, what is it taking away from? It takes away from books, it takes away from games, it takes away from so many things. A story that I heard in uh, Belgium uh, at the uh, European Conference on Reading from Kenneth Goodman uh, from the University of Arizona, he told about what's happening around the world where he gave an example in Africa. The people were waiting, the missionaries are waiting for the materials from the United States to teach. And guess what they were sent? They were sent the Dibbles test. And they're working with African children with no running water, no books, no buildings, and uh, some organization spent the money on tests instead of books, instead of, you know, uh, valuable material, authentic materials to learn literacy. So play is being, is being pushed aside and it, it's very disastrous what's happening to children as I said, as I said earlier. Uh, in L L Levine's own work, uh, she did a survey of children in school. 75% of the children said school is boring in her uh, recent study. 75% of the children said they were not engaged. School is not fun, school is boring. Uh, so therefore, we need to do better in working to teaching the entire child. And I think play has a very uh, significant role. And certainly the work of Vygotsky uh, points to the value uh, of play. 
as you know, the physical education has been pushed out. We have a crisis with obesity uh, in the United States. Some reports say one out of three. Some say one out of four children are obese. Many of the teachers are obese in the United States, again, because of the lack of physical play, playing kickball, playing baseball, et cetera. Uh, the arts have been pushed out. Music have been pushed out all forms of play, if you will. So the next part of the presentation, you're going to see a demonstration of a game that I highly uh, recommend, the phonics game developed by Roma Cox. And what I like about the game is, is it's fun, it's standards-based, and the children learn to play with sounds, and they're learning phonics without even knowing it. They're learning phonemic awareness, which is playing with sounds out loud. And they're learning phonics, which is playing with sounds out loud with print. They're also learning comprehension. They're also learning role playing. And a very uh, fun board game uh, atmosphere uh, that's just uh, uh, delightful. And it's also balanced literacy in that they apply the learning of phonics to the context of reading words and phrases and then books that come with it. So uh, as uh, Richard Allington would say, it's thoughtful literacy. It's not isolated skill and drill that you often see with direct instruction, which is often touted as the way to teach phonics. I think that game playing can uh, do it so much better in a much more fun, holistic way than direct uh, instruction, which is a behaviorist method. Her game is based on constructivism, which I believe is the right paradigm for teaching. I, I think that Piaget and Vygotsky proved over 50 years ago that behaviorism is not the way to go for teaching literacy. So I think there's a sound theoretical basis for why the game works. Please welcome. Roma Cox, the developer and CEO of her phonics game. Thank you so much.